So good morning, church. My name is Ken, and I want to welcome you to Bethel today. Thanks for joining us. Before we begin worship together, I want to remind you of two things coming up here in the life of Bethel Church. One reminder is for kids, and the other is about worship at Bethel next Sunday, June 12th. First, it's almost time for preschool VBS. The theme for Vacation Bible School this year is Heyday, Growing in Friendship with Jesus. VBS is for all kids ages three through kindergarten and will be held at the Bethel Fergus Falls campus on June 14th through the 16th. Parents and grandparents, are the kids in your life signed up yet? Do they have friends that might like to be invited? There's still plenty of time to make sure that the children in your life are signed up to come and hear about Jesus. Look for more information on the Bethel app or website to register. VBS is going to be awesome and we hope to see you there. Also, I want to give you a quick update on the worship schedule for next Sunday, June 12th. In Battle Lake, we will be having one worship service on Sunday the 12th. This service will be outdoors on Bethel's new property at 10.30 a.m. After worship in Battle Lake, there will be lunch and fellowship opportunities starting at 12 p.m. at Lions Park. And in Fergus Falls on June 12th, we will be having two worship services instead of three. The two services that day will be offered at 9.15 and 10.30 a.m. These changes to our Bethel worship schedule are just for next week on Sunday the 12th. So we will look forward to seeing you then outside in Battle Lake at 10.30 or in Fergus Falls at either 9.15 or 10.30. Let's turn our attention now to God as we enter into worship. Hear these words from Nehemiah chapter 9. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the sea and all that is in them. You give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. Church, what an awesome thought that the multitudes of heaven are in constant worship of Jesus, and we get to join in now as God's children, worshiping him who made all of creation. Let's lift our voices together and give him praise. Greetings to those of you who are joining us today, uh, those of you joining us online, glad you're with us. Uh, welcome to those gathered in Battle Lake this morning, good to be with you. So the words of the hymn by Charles Wesley uh, capture us and they call to us, they, they stand and they, they raise waving hands saying, soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor on, strong in the strength of which God provides through his eternal son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. I'm going to invite you, uh, if you would, please turn to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 6 in a Bible. And uh, it is the inspiration for the words of this hymn that I just read by Charles Wesley. And in Ephesians 6, God calls Christians in every generation to armor up, to prepare for spiritual battle. He says to put on the full armor of God. So Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 10 through 17. Please stand as you're able for the reading of God's word. Ephesians 6, starting at verse 10. We read there these words. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. 
In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Uh, Lord, uh, we pray now that as we turn to your word, it may be your voice and only your voice, your thoughts and only your thoughts, your heart and only your heart that we hear and understand. Grant that we might hear your promptings and pleadings, that we might receive your words and accept your welcome. So we pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Our focus today is on what Paul says to take up the helmet of salvation. He, he writes, take the helmet of salvation. And so we need to begin to consider at the very outset, what does a helmet do and what can a helmet not do? What is not its purpose? Uh, a helmet does not prevent blows to the head. Just because you're wearing a helmet doesn't mean you're not going to get hit on the head. A helmet is in place to try to keep the blow to your head from killing you. I mean, that is the point of a helmet, to keep you from serious harm and death. This is, this is the point. Helmets. What a great, great invention. They offer us the comfort that all our skull-cracking activities can now be safely enjoyed. <laughs> There's lots of things that we do that are cracking our heads, and rather than decide not to do it anymore, we just say, now I can do it wearing this thing on my head. That's actually the comedy routine. Have you seen Jerry Seinfeld? He's got this comedic act. You can kind of look it up. And in it, he talks about, and he wonders whether we're really that brilliant as a human race for coming up with this idea of helmets. Actually, actually I want you to take a look at, take, take a look at this. You can point to as proof that the human being is not smart. The helmet is my personal favorite. The fact that we had to invent the helmet. Now, why did we invent the helmet? Well, because we were participating in many activities that were cracking our heads. We looked at the situation. We chose not to avoid these activities, but to just make little plastic hats so that we can continue our head cracking lifestyles. The only thing dumber than the helmet is the helmet law, the point of which is to protect a brain that is functioning so poorly, it's not even trying to stop the cracking of the head that it's in. So yeah, right? We've got all kinds of helmets today, don't we? Think about it for a second. How many different kinds of helmets do you have in your house? I was thinking of different helmets. You've got motorcycle helmets and bicycle helmets, welding helmets, out in the garage maybe, hockey helmets, football helmets, firefighter helmets, skateboarding helmets, ski boarding, uh, snowboarding and ski helmets. I mean, all kinds of helmets. And all of those helmets, in my opinion, make sense. They all seem on some level to make sense. There is, there is one helmet, however, that is a bit curious to me, and it gives me pause, and I wonder about it. And it is the skydiving helmet. Everybody, just think about that for a second. The skydiving helmet. Uh, Seinfeld actually makes fun of this, too. He, he makes fun of the skydiving helmet, saying that if you jump out of a plane and your chute doesn't open, the helmet is now wearing you for protection, Right? That is so true. The helmet is now wearing it. You are what softens the blow for, this, for the skydiving helmet. But we've got all kinds of helmets, and, and the technology over the years has gotten better and better and better. Uh, most helmets these days are made of fiberglass. Better ones might have uh, some carbon in it or some Kevlar in it. But in ancient times, when, when Paul was writing to the Ephesians, uh, helmets were made of, of metal which would be the strongest thing available to them at the time. Maybe, maybe something like bronze or brass. It, it could have been any number of metals, but, but this is the idea. It's something to protect you. And when Paul says that we should put on the helmet of salvation, he's saying to us that there, is, there exist blows that can come to our spiritual life that can actually kill us, that can actually destroy us. And it's a call then to put some bronze between you and the blade coming down on you. It's a call to put some bronze between you and the blade coming down on you. 
What is that? What is the bronze helmet for the Christian? Here's the answer. It is the hope of salvation. We are to wear as a helmet the hope of salvation. So how do you get this, Dave? Where do you get that from? How do you know? It's in the Bible. Let me read for you Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, here's what we read. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and, notice, the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Paul is saying to the church then and to us today that the hope of salvation as a helmet is the bronze between you and the blade coming down on you. The hope of salvation as a helmet is a salvation from something and it is a salvation to something. It is a salvation from sin and death. Apart from Jesus, we are already dead and full of sin. Do you remember what we read in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1? It says there, you were dead in trespasses and sins. This is how we were. This was our condition apart from Christ. And so in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, we read, Jesus died to rescue all of us who live each day in fear of dying. You see, Jesus came for people who are afraid to die because they know their sin separates them from a holy God. And so this passage again says that Jesus died to rescue those, to save those who live each day in the, in the fear of dying. Are you someone like that? Do you know someone like that? Salvation provided in Jesus is salvation from sin and death and separation from God, and it is salvation to eternal life with God. Scripture says, because of what Jesus did at the cross in the empty tomb, that we can hear him say, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Well, well, that's the ultimate answer to the person who lives in fear of dying, isn't it? That you shall, in Christ, never die. You have nothing to be afraid of on the other side of death. When your body gives out, your spirit soars in Christ. John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And so the helmet of salvation is what protects my mind so that I can keep my wits about me in this world. So that I can be alert, to be clear-headed, to operate with understanding that when the fog falls, and the fog will fall, to confuse me, to disorient me, to, de- to cause me to despair and to be discouraged and to fall into hopelessness, as this comes crashing down on me, the fog falls, I lose sight of my destination, where I'm going in Christ, the fog of war falls, and I forget, I forget that, as Scripture says, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Is that you today? Are you here saying, I am longing, I am just longing for the day that Jesus comes for me? You have been saved from sin and death. You have been saved to eternal life with God forever in heaven. So church, don't lose sight of what is to come in Christ. Don't take your eyes off of it. Don't quit the fight. Don't give up. Don't forget either that you've been saved from something or that you've been saved to something. The hope of salvation as a helmet is that no matter how bad and no matter how hard it gets down here, we will not perish but obtain eternal life in the presence of Christ one day forever and ever. Amen? Amen. This is true for us in Christ. And one of the ways that the Bible communicates the certainty of this hope, one of the the ways it does that is to speak of salvation as operating across all time. 
It speaks about the salvation that we have in Jesus as happening in time past, time present, and time future. We are told, according to Scripture, that in Christ, we have already been saved. Have you been saved? You know, some Christian people talk about their salvation, and they do it as they think of of, of it in the past. They, they talk about what happened in the past. A person might talk about a time in their past when they came to a personally held faith in Jesus Christ. Have you? Have you been saved? Maybe it was this life-transforming, trajectory-changing encounter with the gospel of Christ. The penny dropped, the light bulb went on, and you were saved. You were rescued by Jesus from your sin and from death. Eternal separation from God forever. You, you've been saved. Have you been saved? And, and maybe it wasn't an event for you. Maybe it, maybe it, maybe it happened over time, like, like the blossoming of a flower, right? There was a seed, and then a shoot, and then a, a bud, and a petal, and a, another petal, and another petal, and then it's ultimately a flower. And you're going, that's the way it was for me. I'm not sure which petal opened up to faith, but all I know is I'm the flower. God made me what I was not, I am now. I have been saved. I have been made new. The Bible speaks of salvation as happening in the past just like that. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace we have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Did you notice it? We have been saved. And Titus 3, 5 talks about how God has saved us, past tense, not because of works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. You, if you're a believer in Christ, you were called by God's grace, by his word, by his Holy Spirit. You were brought out of darkness into the marvelous light. You were justified by faith in Christ. You were declared righteous in the sight of God. You were set apart, sanctified for God's good pleasure and good purposes. In other words, you became a Christian. You entered into the family of God and you were saved. So yes, we can speak about salvation as something happening in the past that we were saved, but also, but also that we are now being saved. Something happening continuously and, and actively in the present. That I have been saved and now, by God's grace, I am being saved. It's ongoing. We have not yet arrived at heaven's shore, but we're on our way. We're on our way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18 says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 15, We are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. This This is like being in a basketball game and there's two minutes left in the game and the score is 100 to three. You haven't yet won, but you are winning. Like it's, the outcome is not uncertain, right? You are, you are winning. You are being saved. God is doing that in the present. It's happening now. Although you haven't yet gotten to the end, you're being saved. So it is. We've been saved. We are being saved. And it says also in Scripture that we will one day be saved. In fact, I think this is the, the most prominent way that Scripture talks about salvation in Christ. The, the, the biggest high note in all of Scripture is the not yetness of our salvation. There's a, a now and a not yetness to our salvation. We will one day arrive at heaven's shore, but we're not there yet. I think this not yetness, again, is the most dominant note on the subjects of salvation in Scripture. Often salvation is described with a future orientation. Let me give you some examples. In Romans chapter 13, verse 11, Paul says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. 1 Peter 1.5 says that we are guarded through faith by God's power for a salvation 
ready to be revealed in the last time. It's coming. It's coming. It's just not here yet. So what's he talking about? What's he talking about? He's talking about the consummation of our salvation. He's, he's thinking about the second coming of Christ. He's talking about the final chapter of the salvation story that you and I are living. You are to live, I am to live in light of what God will one day make complete. I am being saved. I will one day be saved. Which means this, that when I'm anxious, when you're anxious about getting older, are you getting older? You're all, you're all getting older. Every one of us. And maybe someday, you're at, or maybe you're there now, you're getting to the point where you're, 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 je- you're at that age or that situation in your health where you feel like death is not far. And maybe just maybe you're anxious about that. What does God say to you? What, what helmet of salvation do you place on your head? You place this on, Isaiah 46. Even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will save you. What a good word. You're getting old. <laughs> you're feeling old. God says, I will save you. Because you're not feeling very strong, are you? But I will save you, God says. What about when I'm anxious about what comes after death? About what comes after death? I, I battle unbelief with the promise, as Scripture says, Romans 14, that none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. I belong to him. I'm his kid. What have I got to be worried about? What have I got to be worried about? What if I'm anxious that maybe my faith is not strong enough, that I won't, I won't make it to the very end, that, I, that, I want, that maybe I'll just get tired and quit? The helmet of salvation comes and helps me battle unbelief with the promise that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He will bring you safely ashore, Right? He will bring, me, bring you safely ashore. And that, uh, Hebrews 7, he is able to save to the uttermost. I love that. I love that. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Meaning what? He's praying for you. He's cheering for you. He's encouraging you on so you won't give up. You see, the hope of salvation as a helmet is the bronze between you and the blade coming down on you. It is the hope that while we are not yet there, by faith we can see the shores of heaven and we can stay in the battle. Though we have not yet arrived, we keep our eyes on the one who will bring us safely to himself one day and we encourage one another when it gets hard and we cheer one another on when we're tired. You know, this reminds me of a, of a story, the story of a woman named Florence Chadwick. And I'll close with this. I want you to take a look at this picture. Have a look at this picture. See this? This is, this is Florence Chadwick. Uh, in 1950, she broke the record uh, swimming the English Channel from France to England, which is over 20 miles, in just over 13 hours. Can you imagine swimming for 13 hours? Oh my goodness. It's hard enough to drive for 13 hours. Let them <laughs> swim 13 hours. A year later, she swam in the opposite direction from England to France in just over 16 hours. Can you imagine swimming for 16 hours? When they have you tread water, they do it for five minutes. At five minutes, you're like, whoa, glad I'm done. Swimming for 16 hours. Two years later, Florence, a Southern California girl herself, decided to swim from the coast of California to Catalina Island. Have you ever been to a beautiful spot, by the way? I fully recommend you go visit Catalina Island one of these days. It's 26 miles off the coast of California. On, when the smog isn't there, you can stand on the beach and you can look out and you can, you can see it. And there it is, right? If the smog isn't there. Uh, anyway, 26 miles to, to Catalina. Uh, it's a far swim, but she has proven that she can do it, that she's a strong swimmer, that she has endurance, she has the ability. She already proved that in the English Channel a couple years before. Well, 
The day came for her to jump in the water and swim from the coast to Catalina. And as she was swimming, a horrible fog, not smog, but a fog rolled in and she couldn't see in front of her. She, she, she couldn't see where she was going. She couldn't see ahead of her. She couldn't look ahead and see the shore of the island. By this time, she had been in the water for 15 hours. Again, can you, can you imagine swimming that long? She had swim for 15 hours, and of course, there were boats around her. These boats were there to keep an eye out for sharks and to help her if she was in any crisis or, you know, cramps or she couldn't keep swimming, something, and just to help her if she, if she was in trouble. They were also there to encourage her on. They were also there to uh, encourage her to press on, to cheer for her. Even her mother, even her mother was in one of the boats cheering to her daughter, encouraging her to keep going. They were building her up as she was going. But because of the fog, she couldn't see. And so sightless and tired, she finally gave up. She said, I can't do it anymore. So they pulled her into the boat. And when she got into the boat, and they went a little further ahead, it was there that they could see, as the fog lifted and the sight of shore became apparent, that she was less than a half mile from shore. This woman had gone 25.5 of the 26 miles, but fell short. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Later, when she was asked about this, she said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. She lost hope. She gave up because she lost sight of the shore. Two months later, she tried again. And the same thick fog set in, but this time she made it because, she said, this time, though she couldn't see it with her eyes, she kept a mental image of the shore in front of her the whole time as she swam. Though she couldn't see it with her eyes, she knew where she was heading. Brothers and sisters, it's the same for you and me. The battle, battle is sometimes long and sometimes not very easy, and it's easy for us to lose sight of the shore. Take the helmet of salvation. Let it guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And let's encourage one another, reminding each other that heaven's shore is not far. Let us, Scripture says, be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, thank you for this, your word. Thank you that according to your word, uh, you did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through Jesus. That you died that we may live with you. And now you encourage us to encourage one another, to build each other up. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this word, which encourages us. Help us to take the helmet of salvation, which is the hope of salvation. And Lord, come for us. One day come back to bring us home. We long for that day. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. God's peace be with you.